Using some paper cutout shapes, I'm going to show you the only five ways to organize a building. I'm joined by Margaret and Harold and some of their friends to help demonstrate each organization pattern is like to occupy and to live with. And then armed with this knowledge of these five different arrangements, you'll be able to identify them in the buildings that you inhabit. Or if you become an architect or you are one already, you can use these as starting points for your own spatial designs. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Stuart Hicks, and today I'll be leading a journey of exploration into the only five ways to organize a building. You might be surprised to hear that there are only five ways to organize a building, but it must be true because Francis Ching says it is. Who is Francis Ching, you might ask? Well, he's the author of such classics as Building Construction Illustrated. I have three copies for you to see here. He's also the author of Design Drawing and Building Codes Illustrated, uh, and the author of the indelible Form, Space, and Order. Within the pages of this almost, dare I say, biblical work, we find five essential ways to organize space. And they are... Centralized. Linear. Radial. Clustered. And grid. Each of these five are good for different things. Some are easily added onto without losing their coherence, some are easily understood right away by people visiting for the first time, and other arrangements are good at showing people which spaces are the most important versus which ones are maybe less important. Scene 1, Centralized. Centralized plans are arrangements where a group of spaces are situated around a center, you know, as the name suggests. There's usually a primary space that is, like, large and dominant. There might be a series of secondary spaces arranged around that central one, though, and then the relationship between the smaller ones and the larger ones are what give the whole grouping coherence and order. However, all the pieces could be arranged in a number of different ways, as long as they help ensure that the primary space stays primary. Round spaces or hexagons like this work really well as centralized organizations and they're also good for buildings that don't need to fit into their relationship with their neighbors. For these reasons, they're often reserved for really important buildings that want to represent their importance to others by standing out or having a super clear and easily understandable organization. It's something that people see and then understand right away. Oh hey, it's a circle. I know where the middle is. Centralized spaces are said to be stable, which means that they're really only one way to read them. We always know our relationship to the center, and that is usually unchallenged. Centralized spaces are also said to be static, meaning that there's only one true center, and it isn't easy to add on to a centralized organization without losing or destroying the, uh, the underlying organizational pattern. Good examples of centralized organizations include the Renaissance masterpiece The Tempietto of San Pietro in Rome. Designed by Mamonte, it is a distillation of proportional principles arrayed around a circle. Of course, there are a lot of other ancient examples too, like the Villa Rotunda, but there are current examples as well. The Solo House by KG DVS might be considered a centralized plan. I'd even argue that Su Fujimoto's Musashino Art University Museum and Library is a centralized plan. It doesn't look like the others, but it's a segmented spiral of walls that all wrap around a centralized space. Scene 2, Linear. Linear organizations consist essentially of a series of spaces in a line. These spaces could either be next to one another and directly connected together, or they can be linked through a, a separate linear space like a hallway. The series of spaces are usually repetitions of similar elements, but it doesn't have to be that way because the linear arrangement can make even spaces that are very different from one another cohere together because of the strength of the line as an organizing element. Usually linear spaces allow each part to have a connection with the outside. Linear organizations have a direction. And whereas the central organization is stable and static, a linear one is associated with movement, and it can be extended or grow completely along its length. The line can also bend around to create various conditions all the way up to creating exterior enclosures, like a space made out of other spaces. Centralized organizations also have a single, most important location at the center, but linear ones can create distinction and hierarchy through a few different methods. One might be to have a space along its length that is unique, maybe it's larger or like a different color, or more naturally, sitting at the ends of the line is uh, sitting at the major axis of termination, creating a kind of viewing corridor which uh, highlights the, the end piece. Also, for similar reasons, corners become special spaces along the line. Linear arrangements are good for a few different kinds of programs. Museums work well arranged in lines because they are meant to create a sequence of experiences for visitors. The Jewish Museum in Berlin by Daniel Liebeskin is actually two linear organizations on top of one another, a straight line and a bent one. 
Multi-unit housing also works well so that each unit faces the exterior and doesn't look into their neighbors. But even a single house can be organized linearly, like the Weekend House by KGDVS, which is a series of rooms placed together. Scene 3, Radial. Radial organization combines elements from the centralized and the linear strategies. It has an important central space with linear elements that extend out from it, creating spokes like in a bicycle wheel. In combining the central and the linear, it creates something slightly different from either. Centralized organizations are closed and can't be added onto, but radial ones could extend outward quite easily and connect with other radial things. So they reach out into their context and don't sit so closed off as a separate object. Often a radial plan will have a regularly shaped central space with arms that could be either uh, similar or different from one another. If the arms are slightly offset from one another and they no longer pass through the center like this, they create what's called a pinwheel organization. And this has a kind of rotational trajectory of movement as things swirl around the center. Radial arrangements don't seem to be super popular these days, but corporate buildings can take their shape. They provide corridors that all meet in the central meeting space. A lot of older prisons and other institutional building types were commonly arranged in radial arrangements as well. A more recent house that might be considered radial is Moss's house number 10, which has four wings arranged around a center cutout. As for pinwheels, Frank Lloyd Wright loved them, especially in some of his taller buildings. They allowed him to maintain the diagonal arrangement of spaces while allowing for a four at the center. Scene four, clustered. Clustered arrangements are basically like still life arrangements of objects. They relate elements together purely through proximity. They're usually made stronger or more clear if the parts are similar, which reinforces their belonging together. However, these clusters could have things that are very different and still cohere together. Even though there's no larger organizing principle like the presence of a line or a center, you might have smaller relationships between some of the parts but not others. There might be specific alignments that make certain parts relate more than others. Clusters aren't static or fixed like centralized organizations. They can grow or shift and still maintain their coherence. There's also no inherent stable point that is most important. Instead, hierarchy can be made through spacing or orientation or in changing the size of the different parts. Clusters aren't very associated with things that are like grand and formal like temples or religious buildings. Their organizations aren't easily perceived all at once. Instead, you need to explore around it in order to understand it. The parts don't add up into a single heroic gesture like with centralized organizations. Clusters are probably the least formal of all the arrangement types and are particularly popular at the moment. The Japanese firm Sana makes some great clustered plans, like the Museum of the 21st Century or Ryu Nishizawa's Moriyama House. Both place units together as separate objects that leave space for movement on all sides. While we're in Japan, Su Fujimoto's Tokyo apartments are also a great clustered arrangement of small house shapes. Each plan seems like a haphazard arrangement at first, but in reality, each piece is perfectly placed to create specific connections and breaks between the parts. Scene 5, Grid. Grids are probably the most common form of organization in architecture, and this is for a variety of different reasons. A grid is a system of two or more sets of regularly spaced parallel lines. In these kinds of organizations, a gridded field could be either in two or three dimensions, and these regulate a series of different elements. These elements could either be points like in columns, or lines like walls, or shapes like rooms like I have here. The grid provides a certain amount of regularity and continuity to the pattern of the elements. The most common grid is based on the geometry of the square. Because of the quality of its dimensions and its bilateral symmetry, a square grid is essentially non-hierarchical and bidirectional. It can be used to break the scale of a surface down into measurable units, and it can give a surface a texture like this. Because this underlying structure exists to guide how things go together, grids can accept elements that very, aren't very much alike one another and, and still make them cohere as a whole. And grids can also be manipulated in and of themselves. They can be added to or subtracted from and still maintain their overall structure. You can even adjust the spacing within the grid, and it still maintains the structure even if it's irregular in a few dimensions. A grid could become a thing or an object in and of itself, and a, por and a portion of the grid could be dislocated or rotated around about a point within the basic pattern. Grids are almost so common in architecture that offering examples means just looking around you. However, some of my favorites include Sanaa's plan for the Solverine School of Management where the grid is followed so closely that it seems almost comical. Or their housing project in Paris where the grid is really at odds with the overall shape of the building. The individual units don't seem like they could be packed into such a fluid shape. A good example of the grid being treated as an object might include Peter Eisenman's house number three. The house is conceived as two different grids of columns and walls rotated from one another, causing them to collide. 
Those are the five ways to organize a building. Of course, no building is perfectly any one of these five, and there are infinite amounts of variability and ways to combine these types. But if you found this video helpful or interesting, please consider giving the video a like. Watch some of my other videos and subscribe and hit the bell if you're into thinking a little bit more about the built environment with me every week.